What's up, everybody, and welcome back to TarHeelIllustrated.com. Or, of course, if you're watching on our growing YouTube channel, that is Tar Heel Illustrated. I'm THI staff writer Jacob Turner, and joining me, as he always does, our very own publisher, Andrew Jones. And, Andrew, we're here for the, what is it now, the fourth episode of the yes. THI Preview Podcast. I had to go back in the memory a little bit, and I was about to say three, and then I was like, no, nah, that's not right. It's been four. The this season's the starting game. to scoot through now. We're I know, man. That. I was We're thinking in that about routine that routine zone where you wake up and I was like, Oh man, we're in the middle of game week and it's game day. And next thing you know, we're going to be halfway through the season. It's crazy. I was thinking about that a couple of days ago. Like, man, everybody played. I, I always tell people August is the longest month of the year because yep. you're writing all these football stories and nothing's happening. Yeah. And then and the all of a sudden the games come boom. Next thing yep. you know, it's basketball season. You take off. Exactly. So Carolina preparing for their fourth game of the season this weekend, obviously, at Georgia Tech, Saturday evening, 7.30 p.m. kickoff, ACC Network will actually be played at the Mercedes-Benz Stadium, home of the Atlanta Falcons, for those who don't know. So I think that was a, a deal that Georgia Tech has kind of worked out where they're playing one home game there a year. Um, and yeah. Carolina just happened to be the one that, that was selected for that one. So be a little bit different in an environment than Bobby Dodd Stadium. I think it sits like 20,000 or more people than, than Bobby Dodd does. So, But really awesome stadium. And I don't, first time for you down there too, AJ, correct? In this one, yeah. I've done football game in Georgia Dome, which no longer exists. And yep, I did that thing see, 2001 ACC tournament, 2004 regionals, 316 regionals when Duke beat Xavier in, in, to, in the regional final. Mm -hmm. Locker room, Chris Duhon hugging the ball, wouldn't let it go. Uh, see, 2009 ACC tournament. Mm -hmm. um, gosh. I'm sure there are other times. I'm about to say, I know there's ACC sports, tournament in Phillips Arena as well. Mm -hmm. And I've been to Georgia Tech a ton of times. Yeah, Bobby Dodd's a cool stadium. I went down there for the first time a couple of years ago. Actually, the first game I was ever on the field for photography during uh, Mac's first year back. So, cool Carolina goes down there next year to play at Georgia State, and their home stadium is Turner Field. Where yeah, old Braves. The old Turner Field, which was the Olympic Stadium in 96, and it's where the Braves played for a long time, up until yep. a couple, about three years ago. So, uh, a lot of different stadiums and arenas the Tar Heels will have been in. in no, definitely. And, yeah, and people remember the Omni is very famous in a kind of a bad way for UNC basketball for years. So 1977, 1985, et cetera. Mm -hmm. 1984, Jordan's last game at Carolina was in Atlanta in the Omni. This isn't a basketball podcast. I'm just thinking of the Carolina connection. A lot of connections and also, in Atlanta. And, and since we're doing this, the uh, second largest uh, contingent of UNC alumni outside of North Carolina or in the Atlanta area. Mm -hmm. It used to be the, the largest and second was Washington, D.C., but now the largest is the New York City area, then it's Atlanta, then it's Washington, D.C. Mm -hmm. Yeah, the so, New York uh, City one surprised me. I know we're not talking about this, but <laughs> the New York City one surprised me when I heard that. I was like, really, New York City? I wouldn't have thought that. But I guess there's so many people living up there. Oh, uh, there's a ton. I mean, I've covered Carolina up in New York a lot. I've covered it in Madison Square Garden a bunch of times. and. Mm -hmm covered the game against UCLA in Brooklyn when they wore yep. the black uniforms. There are a ton of Carolina fans there. Oh, I can imagine. Uh, there are Carolina fans everywhere you go, man. Oh, yeah. It's a national brand. I was in France. I, I know this isn't what we're supposed to talk about, but very, very quickly. 2005, I uh, went out to see my buddy in San Francisco two weeks before I got married, and we went to the war, uh, the, the war, I guess, Fisherman's War, that, right there on the, uh, yeah. on the water. Mm -hmm. And there's a sporting goods store. And in the window, they had a, a UNC basketball uniform on, oh, a, on, a, on a, one of those dummies or whatever. Really? Mannequins. Yeah. That's shocking. Would not have expected that. Never yeah. They would. just won the title in 05. It was uh, uh -huh. actually, they won the title on a Monday night. And Thursday I was at my buddy's place in San Francisco. The next day is when I saw that Jersey. And I thought that's pretty wild. They're just everywhere. That's wild. Yeah, that is crazy. I never would have thought that. But back to the topic before we go off on a whole yes. tangent. Should <laughs> we go off on a whole tangent? We can make a simple podcast. People start flicking it. their middle finger at us for not talking about George Tech game. So yeah, exactly, exactly. We'll get back to the topic for you guys. And Carolina obviously sitting at two and one, one and one. The ACC um, coming off a big win over UVA at home, fifty nine to thirty nine. So carrying a little bit of momentum down to Atlanta, and then looking at Georgia Tech, one and two overall, zero and one in the ACC. Um, I guess let's start with Georgia Tech before we kind of dive in um, to, to the matchup a little bit more. For those who don't know, we're not going to talk about kind of what Carolina's done too much. We actually put out a podcast on uh, Tuesday kind of talking about what we've learned through the first three games. So if you want to kind of get our insight, there's about 40 minute long podcast on kind of our thoughts and, and what we think about the team three, three games in. We also did a little bit of a look ahead. Go watch that one and click off that one because you won't get as much of that information in this one since we've already hit on it. But Georgia Tech one and two, 0 and one, the ACC really, you know, started off with a bad loss at home to Northern Illinois, 22 to 21. I'm going to let you hit on them after I kick it to you because it's okay. not a great team last year. I don't think they won a single game. 45 to 17 win over Kennesaw State. 
the following weekend. And then obviously, which I'm sure a lot of people know, we've actually talked about it a little bit, um, 14 to eight loss at Clemson. So definitely put up a little bit of a fight um, against the Tigers uh, in South Carolina and, and maybe feeling a little bit unfortunate not to walk away with the win there, holding them to 14 points is, is definitely a good thing. So I think Georgia Tech's a team that, you know, looking obviously sitting at one and two, NIU loss is bad. Whenever Kennesaw State, excuse me, is expected. And then I think the way they played against Clemson and how close they kept it, obviously still lost. A loss is a loss at the end of the day. Um, is, is, is a positive for them. And I'm sure they'll be taking a little bit of momentum um, going into this weekend as well because of how they played, especially on the defensive side of the ball against, you know, one of the top teams in the country, supposedly. So, yeah, I think Georgia Tech is a – I think it's going to be an interesting game. I think it's obviously one Carolina should win. But I think looking at Georgia Tech, that they've been, a, I guess, a little bit of up and down, to say the least, in their first three games. Last week I – I said that Georgia Tech wasn't a very good team and, and they're probably not a very good team yet. But if you peel away the layers, I'm a big fan of, OK, what happens at the line of scrimmage? And sometimes something goes bad in a game that shouldn't go bad. Turnovers, those kinds of things mm -hmm. uh, or missed field goals and say, OK, what if that didn't happen? Could they have won? Would they have won? If you go back to the Northern, Northern Illinois game. Georgia Tech got gained them by 127 yards. Only held them to 302 yards. So Northern Illinois and Clemson, the two FBS teams they played, are averaging less than th uh, averaging less than 300 yards a game against Georgia Tech. So the improvement on defense has actually been there because remember Clemson scored 73 on them a year ago. Yeah. So clearly they were much better this past week, and I thought they were more physical too, much more physical than I remember them being uh, a year ago, even two years ago. Uh, they but they allowed four sacks against Northern Illinois and they missed three field goals. They also fumbled well into Northern Illinois territory and were stopped at downs at the two-yard line. So they lost 22-21, but they were on the cusp of scoring a lot more points mm -hmm. and winning that game rather convincingly. Um, Northern Illinois had 12 possessions in that game. Eight of them were three plays or fewer. Wow. The problem is on the other ones, they uh, they were pretty long drives. I believe that yeah. they had uh, – their scoring drives were eight plays – 12 plays and nine plays. And I think they went for like 70 yards or more on all three of those. So if you can get a rhythm going against Georgia tech and Clemson had some rhythm drives Saturday that you could move the ball on them. It may take a lot of plays because they haven't been giving up big plays to anybody. Uh, and that's Carolina's specialty. So if Carolina has to pick its way down the field, that'll be interesting because you got to use more receivers mm -hmm. and you got to open up more holes and, and be consistent pounding the ball. So if, if they make Carolina, they turn this into a physical game, which is what they did with Northern Illinois. And they absolutely did with Clemson. They turned that thing into a bloodbath almost. Oh, yeah. I think Carolina's chances of winning are less if it's that kind of a game, not because Carolina can't be physical, but I think that's the only way Georgia Tech can win a game like this. I don't, Georgia Tech is not going to, you know, they're going to uh, go over the top of the defense. They're not going to bust a bunch of long plays. They are a, a, a pick their way down the field, an incremental movement type team on both sides of the ball. That's what they've been through three games. So I think in order to beat North Carolina, that's what they have to be. And then look at the Clemson game, Jacob, mm -hmm. um, I thought it was very interesting that they, A, outgained Clemson, 309 to 284. Uh, they, uh, Georgia Tech had drives of 14, 16, 9, and 9 plays. And what they got out of that were two field goals, stopped on downs, and a punt. Mm -hmm. So they moved the ball against the – Clemson's defense is pretty good. They held Georgia to no touchdowns. So Georgia Tech was able to move the ball at times against them. I just think this is a team that kind of gets in its own way. They're still kind of young. Uh, they they – they, they allow a lot of sacks. I think they've allowed 11 sacks on the season. They only have two or three themselves. And, you know, just get stopped on fourth down. And they haven't been great on third downs. Against Clemson, I think they were three of 15 on third down. So, uh, you know, this is a game North Carolina should win. On paper and in person, they should line up, win this game, win it by a couple touchdowns, put it in their back pocket, and head back home, right? Mm. But – I do think that Mac and the staff are trying to communicate to the team this week that this club's going to be physical. They're going to try to punch you because they know that that's the only way that they can win. They have to try to come out and rumble with you some and win a game that way. And they're going to go after Sam, even though they're not getting many sacks. Um, and it's an opportunity, I think, for Carolina to maybe create some stuff on defense because of the sack issue. Maybe you see Bateman dialed up a little bit more and try to change the game a little bit that way. But, uh, I kind of like what I've seen from Georgia Tech, but I don't think that Georgia Tech has a very high ceiling. Yeah, so Carolina yeah. can't play down to Georgia Tech's ceiling. They have to play above it, and if they do, they'll win the game. 
Yeah, just to dive into some stats on Georgia Tech, dive into the numbers a little bit more on the defensive side of the ball. You mentioned holding their opponents to less than 300 yards. Actually, um, allow, only allowing 281.7 yards per game, only 17.7 points per game. In comparison, look at Carolina, 381 yards per game, 24.3 points per game. I mean, obviously looking at Carolina, a little bit harder of a competition when you factor in Virginia Tech and Virginia versus, you know, the likes of NIU and Kennesaw State. So, you know, good deep, but, you know, granted to Georgia Tech, you got to play, you play another loss to Northern Illinois was a, was a tough one, but defensive side of the ball, they've actually been pretty good. And I think that really culminated down at Clemson. And then switching over to the offensive side of the ball, you got Jordan Yates, who we've talked about nephew of a former UNC quarterback, TJ Yates had a decent season so far. Um, 65.3 completion percentage, 592 passing yards, five touchdowns, one interception I'm running back. Jameer Gibbs is, is, is toted the ball. Okay. I mean, nothing great. 40 carries 185 yards, 4.6 yards per carry. Even more interesting than that, though, you look at the other running backs on that list. They've got two other running backs with over 120 yards this season. So they've got multiple guys that can kind of get back there and, and well, tote and the Yates, rock. And Yates can run the ball, yeah, too. Yeah, he, he's, a, he's a decent runner as well. Um, looking at the wide receiver room, you got Kyrick McGowan, 13 receptions, 205 yards, 15.8 yards per catch and three touchdowns. So he's kind of been their main target this year and a guy that's a – a big play player, but even looking down, you got Malachi Carter, another wide receiver, not far behind him, 12 receptions. So one less than McGowan, 179 yards, 14.9 yards per catch. So another guy that's a, you know, it looks like when Georgia Tech decides to throw the ball that they have some big play guys that can, can get some big yardage out of them. So they're, they're like a chunk play team. Yeah, Their big plays team. are chunks, mm-hmm. um, which is, I, I haven't gone over every snap that they've taken. So I don't know how many uh, catastrophics that they've created for opposing defenses, but mm-hmm. Um, but they do, they have gotten some chunks on passing because Yates can roll and he can see he's got really he's kind oh, of yeah. cagey. He's got good vision. Exactly. By the way, he, he wasn't their starting quarterback uh, against Northern Illinois. Mm-hmm. Jeff Sims was one of their representatives at the ACC kickoff in Charlotte. Uh-huh. Mm-hmm. And Sims got hurt. A lot of people thought, okay, Sims could have a fantastic season this year. He was one of those, another one of those coastal quarterbacks that people talked about. Mm-hmm. And Yates is a redshirt freshman. Sims got hurt. He hurt his shoulder. And mm-hmm. Yates, I think, has done pretty well. And um, and he wears number thirteen like his uncle, and uh, he looks like a pretty nice player. I, I like what I saw from him against Clemson. They weren't he wasn't getting him in the end zone, but he was going up against pretty good defense. And I thought that there was some really creative, cagey things he did out there. And he's also athletic, so all that kid needs is just more reps, more, see himself on film, and he's going to get better and better. Yeah, definitely got 151 uh, QB rating, 151 QB rating so far. So, you know, five five TDs, one interception is not bad. Uh, nine sacks on the season. So 11 total when you even uh, factor in what Sims played in, in that opening game. So not great at protecting him so far this year. But like I said, when you got a guy who can roll out a little bit, that can that can kind of mask the O-line a little bit. And just to hit on the defense, one more thing. Um, Ayindi Ely, I'm probably butchering that name. So apologies if I am. Leads the team in tackles with 28. Um, a linebacker for them. They've actually got two other linebackers with 24 tackles apiece. So linebacker, of course, seems like a, a strong group for them. Only, uh, but it, as a as a caveat to that, I think you mentioned this earlier as well. Only two sacks on the season for Georgia Tech. So not a team that that tends to, at least they might get to the quarterback a little bit, but they're not put bringing them down behind the line of scrimmage. Yeah. So. I think it's a decent team. I mean, I think statistically there's a lot of things that you could build on from an offense and a decent defensive side of the ball overall. Yeah, I believe that he's transferred from Maryland. Also, Charlie Charlie uh, Thomas, yep, a linebacker. Uh, he's um he's a. I was watching the game. I taped the game against clubs. I tape all the ACC games. And I was watching it last night. Of course, I could only see almost the full first half because of, they had a long lightning delay mm-hmm. and rain delay that uh, I only sent the record for three and a half hours. Didn't think I'd need extra time on that <laughs> and uh, didn't get to see the second half. But they, yeah. they actually said at one point during the game that he, he even played uh, defensive end in a game last year. He he's one of those he, linebackers with yeah, 24 tackles too. So he's, a, the- he's a guy. He's Back back in the day, we say you know well, that guy could chew that guy chews glass. <laughs> yeah, he's telling you know one, one of the one of those muck raking grinders who just is oblivious to contact. It doesn't mm-hmm. matter. Just boom, I got well, I love that's a fun going. guys to watch right there. And he's a, he's one of the rare guys that chews glass and is incredibly athletic at the same time. So mm-hmm. you know, like people think about Jaquarius Conley. 
similar to that, just a baller, man. Exactly, Football yeah. Player. So they got to have to keep an eye on them. And they also run that three – they ran that three safety thing that Virginia did. They ran it against Clemson, and it caused problems for Clemson. And, and I was reading some of the Clemson write-ups. A, a friend of mine, David Hood, who runs the Tiger Net, does a really good job, you know, giving you insight to what Clem, – you know, if Clemson has struggles, why did they struggle? And a lot of Clemson players said that they saw Georgia Tech do stuff on defense they hadn't seen before. And I think it was interesting that two games in, Tech made some pretty sweeping changes defensively, and it worked. They held Clemson to 284 yards and two touchdowns, hmm. and uh, the Tigers struggled, yeah. and the fans are very concerned there. But everyone's asking what's wrong with Clemson. Well, let's give Georgia Tech some credit for that too. My Georgia Tech went up in my estimation. It wasn't just because DJU was off on a lot of his passes. I just love the physicality that Georgia Tech brought to the line of scrimmage, the way that they swarmed. There were a lot of white hats around the ball all the time. So I, I think that they probably – it was good for Carolina that Tech did that because I'm sure that that film got the Tar Heels' attention. Oh, yeah. I, I had said in preseason, hey, you know, I could see Carolina losing a game that they shouldn't really lose. And you know, I could see them going down to Atlanta, playing in a half-empty dome and – and having a tough time generating energy and maybe losing a game like that because that stuff happens. We've seen it happen every weekend in college football so far. I think that's less likely to happen because of the physicality that Georgia Tech played with. I think that that definitely – and I'm sure the staff didn't bother showing the Northern Illinois or Kennesaw State film. No need to. No. Because even on offense, I thought that they did some good things on offense. They just didn't punch it in. They didn't convert on third downs because – I'm not sure they're there yet as a program as mm -hmm. they continue to try growing uh, as, as they're working on the building process. But I thought that was a step forward for them the other night. And I think Carolina should be ready to play and probably will be ready to play. Yeah. I mean, you look at Georgia Tech just to hit on them one more time. I mentioned it earlier, but defense really hasn't been the issue. I mean, 17.7 .7 points per game, less than 300 yards per. I know, like, like I said, there's two lesser opponents in there, but still 21 points against NIU, they let up. You think if you hold NIU to 21 points, you think you'd be able to put more points on them. That, or excuse me, 22 points, you think you'd be able to put more points on them than that. Kennesaw State only had 17, and then Clemson only had 14. So, yeah, defensively, it seems like they're a pretty good unit. It just seems like the offensive side of the ball, and I don't know how much the injury of Jeff Sims has probably aided to that. I'm sure it has aided because, I mean, I know yeah. Yates has been solid, but Jeff Sims, like you mentioned, was – touted as one of the better quarterbacks in the in the coastal division in particular coming into the season. So a little bit unfortunate on that side of the ball. But yeah, uh, another bit about the defense. issue. Let me throw another note in about their defense in the Clemson game is that they actually stopped Clemson twice in the red zone. They forced a fumble and then they stopped them on downs in the red zone. Oh wow. So uh, you know those are some man up stuff yeah. right there. And yeah. if a team does that and they, and they did it against Northern Illinois. They just allowed a few of those drives, and they shot, them, shot themselves in the foot offensively in that game. They should have won that game. Mm -hmm. They'd be 2-1 and one with a narrow loss at Clemson on their resume, and people would be looking at them very, very differently. And Northern Illinois, they were winless last year, but that's a program that's won games before. I mean, they were in the Orange Bowl, like, what, nine years ago. Dave Doran was the coach at Northern Illinois, and they got to the Orange Bowl, and he didn't coach the Orange Bowl because he took the NC State job. But – uh, they had a Heisman Trophy candidate on that team, and they were ranked in the top 10. And they had won games for years. They beat Wake Forest. Wake Forest fans might remember that. They beat Maryland back when Maryland was in the ACC. They've won games. They just weren't very good last year, and it's a transition program. But that Northern Illinois and MAC teams are different than something that you might get at the bottom half of the Sun Belt or some of the other leagues. You know, Absolutely. The, the, the Mac has pretty tough teams, pretty decent teams, and they win. Hell, a Mac team just won at Virginia Tech the other day, scored 44 yeah. points against them. So, exactly. Mac 100%. teams win games sometimes. So, they, that wasn't a garbage. That wasn't Kennesaw State, whom Tech should, which Tech should never play. Mm -hmm. you, know, you shouldn't play Kennesaw no. State. So, no, at the end of the day, no, that, that's always going to be. But I'm sure they're glad they did because it's their W right now. Yeah, exactly, man. I mean, obviously, probably build on that. And I'm sure that the fact yeah. that they were played so well against Kennesaw State probably, you know, helped them in a little bit of confidence going into the Clemson game. So let's let's switch the focus to Carolina now. Um, two and one overall, one and one in the ACC, like I mentioned, coming off a big win over UVA. I want to start with this. Do you think the fact that Georgia Tech is such a physical team on the defensive side of the ball is a worry for Carolina? Because I know it was changed against UVA and they were a lot more physical at the line of scrimmage, but I'm going to continue to say it. For me, it took a guy like Mandy Alonzo calling out their physicality for them to step up because that was an issue in the first two games. Is that potentially a, a problem Carolina could have if the offensive line doesn't, in particular, maybe the offense as a whole doesn't match Georgia Tech's physicality, like I said, which has been a, you know, cause of criticism this year 
Well, I think Mandy Alonzo's comments are what they were. I don't know how much it motivated the team. I think that it gave maybe a little bit more spark, but you still have to get the job done. Yeah, you still got to do it. Yeah. Mm-hmm. And as I noted on our other podcast that we did, Carolina struggled offensively in the first two games last year and then turned it on because they got a lot of stuff on film and he fixed it. This staff is really good at evaluation, identifying and fixing. And so we, we, I think that's more of what we saw. I also don't think that North Carolina should be all that concerned about Georgia tech in the sense that gosh, they're a physical team. So, you know, we're going to have some issues. They're going to have some issues if they're not ready. That's when the physicality could really get to them. Uh, and, And they are, P5 physical, physical yeah. era, P5 physical team, but Carolina needs to be that. So the P word, Jacob, the process that this program is in is becoming tougher. Mac said before the, you know, the week of the Virginia tech game, they were tougher and more physical than us the last two years. He said the week of the Virginia game, they were tougher and more physical. They didn't, Carolina didn't need Mandy Alonzo to say anything. Mac was telling them that very same thing. You know, I think toughness and physicality is the next layer. A consistency in that area on both sides of the ball is the next layer in the process of UNC becoming what it's going to eventually be under Mac Brown. So I actually think that this is a good matchup. This game comes at a good time. Carolina should win. It'd be a good road win, a league road win, and against a team that's going to be really, really confident given how things went against Clemson, and Carolina should respect them. You know, part of the process is learning to respect opponents, right? Well, Georgia Tech's been down for a little bit, but you must respect what you saw against Clemson. That's what I saw. I'm sure that's what these kids are seeing. So that part of the process will be tested. But if they're ready to play, I don't think Tech's physicality in the end Will, will matter because Carolina's better. They're more talented. They'll hit on some big plays and they should win a decent number of those battles if they are the team that we all thought they were before the season. And Matt continues to tell us that they're ahead of where he thought they would be. So if that's the case, they should be able to meet that physicality Saturday night. Definitely. Kind of adding on that. I know we've kind of hit on it a little bit, but you know, I like to ask you this every time we do a preview pod. What do you think Carolina you know, has to do Uh, to win on Saturday night? Well, they have to be ready to play. Uh, If there's 40,000 empty seats in that place, they can't, they have to focus. They were fine last year with with COVID. So if it's a weird, awkward environment, it's not like they've been playing in raucous houses for years and years and years. I mean, Mm. they all had to take that sidestep last year. So they have to generate their own energy. They have to be ready to play and they have to be physical. If they do those three things, I think they'll have the big plays on offense enough. And Mac or Sam will do what Sam does. Mm-hmm. And they'll win the game. Now, do they win 24-14 or do they win 40 to 14? I think a lot of that depends on the bells and whistles. Mm-hmm. You know, if they have enough bells and whistles to win a game like this, 40 to 14, I think that they have a chance to do that. I'm not predicting a blowout, but I'm just saying we know that Josh Downs is one. We know that Ty Chandler is one now. Well, obviously, Sam is. Choffrey Brown can be one of those guys, but you can't drop passes right in your hands over the middle. Mm-hmm. And his brother was there, and his brother went through that process, so he was probably educating him a little bit more on that again this week. Mm-hmm. You have to have other guys step up to win a game like this, 40 to 14. I do think that that's kind of the measure of where they are, whatever the final outcome is and what the line of scrimmage tells us. And I'm not predicting 40 to 14. So Georgia Tech fans who are watching this, I'm not saying North Carolina is going to go in there and route this team. I'm just saying that that's the range of what could happen. Mm -hmm. And it'll tell us about where this team is. Definitely. Yeah, definitely. If it's it's 24 to 14, and let me finish. It's 24 to 14. You take it in your back pocket and you move on, you get a win. Because I said a couple of days ago, this series of games is about winning and getting better. Mm -hmm. So you don't really have to impress a lot of people right now. You just have to win and get better. Mm -hmm. And sometimes 24 to 14 might be winning and getting better, Mm -hmm. especially if it gets a lot more stuff on Phil. If they win by a bigger margin than that, and we'll see how it plays out. But I do think that that's the range and how this thing could go. Yeah, I'm looking to see on, on. I'm looking to see if they can build on the the rushing performance, particularly in particular with Chai Chandler, what he was able to do against UVA, against Georgia Tech. And one of the main reasons is I know Georgia Tech, you know, has been a solid defense, only 281 yards letting allowing that so far this season. But if you dive deeper into it, if you actually look at some of the top teams um, through three games in total defense, Georgia Tech's actually one of the worst against the run in that in that upper echelon, if not the worst, allowing 157 yards on the ground per 
um, per game this season. So I, I think, I think the running game should be something Carolina targets. I mean, obviously it was a struggle in the, in the first two games. It looks like that's improved. It was so much better against UVA. Even Sam Howell has been using his legs. He's been able to consistently run over the last couple of games. So, you know, if I'm the coaching staff and obviously I'm not, I would think that'd be something you're looking to target when you kind of dive deeper into stats. If they can establish a run game and kind of exploit that it is something that Georgia Tech struggled with this year. I think that'll be big for their chances on Saturday. Yeah, I think you're right. I think when you're evaluating a team's growth, you, you can't have the between tackle stuff they did in Blacksburg against Georgia state and then flare up against UVA. And it, like, to your point, you know, because some guy, you know, disrespected yeah. him and then go back to where you were in the first two you games build on your it. tackles. Yeah. Because that would just mean the Virginia game was a flare up. If they build on it and are like that again, then we're saying, Oh, okay. So maybe this is who they are. Mm -hmm. And that's probably what you could start expecting moving forward. Remember last year, they didn't run the ball great the first two games, but they exploded against Virginia tech and they were, and other than the UVA game, they were so, so down in Tallahassee, they were outstanding in the run game pretty much the rest of the, well, they weren't great against Notre Dame, but they were still, they weren't completely awful. I mean, we no, saw what the run game really was. Team. I mean, that's going to happen sometimes. But uh, like I said, I think this team, this staff identifies things well. I think they address them well. And I think that they have good kids, smart kids, teachable kids for the most part. And they do fix stuff during the course of the year. And they will adapt. They showed last year when they went to the youth movement on defense, they'll adapt during the course of the year. They'll make some changes. They've already gone from – Rucker playing five snaps against Virginia Tech to playing, what was it, like 42 or something like that the other night against uh, really Virginia. Good. Cedric Gray didn't play a snap at linebacker against Virginia Tech, and he started and played all but 14. I think Asante played 14 snaps the other night against uh, Virginia. So yeah. they're not just rolling the same thing out there and hoping it works each week. They're, they're massaging. They're kneading dough big time, and we'll see the result of that this week. And I actually expect Carolina to play pretty well. Yeah, And I, I think you build off of last week, no letdown. This, the older guys in this team understand what this is about. I would imagine that the words that Tamon Fox and Jeremiah Gemmel and Sam and, and Trey Morrison, those guys are, are communicating to the rest of the team. And Jordan Tucker and Josh Azudu is that we, we have to put our foot on the pedal and keep it pushed, keep it pressed. Do mm -hmm. not let up because they have something significant to play for. But you can't go down there and lose Georgia Tech and have anything significant to play for after that, for the most part. Yeah, I know what you mean on that. Yeah, I'm, I'm on board with you, Joe. I think Carolina wins the game and the kind of segue into what we want to hit on last. So I guess it's prediction time, as we all like to do towards the end of this one. I, I know I submitted my staff picks yesterday, I believe. I believe I, well, a couple of days ago on Monday. Um, I, I said 35-21, if I remember correctly. I think Carolina puts points up against this defense, and I'm basing that a lot off of what I've seen over the last couple of games in particular. You know, 59 points in back-to-back -back games. Um, and then I think Carolina defensively plays well against a Georgia Tech offense that has struggled um, a lot through the opening three games and has found it difficult to, to put up points. I mean, albeit against Kennesaw State, which is Kennesaw State, no disrespect to them. So 35-21 is my prediction. Um, I, I think it stays close for a little bit, but I think Carolina, like we've seen a lot with this team since Mac taking over, I think in that third quarter in particular, we might see them pull away with a little bit and, you know, 14 points isn't necessarily a comfortable win, but I think it'll it'll be a somewhat comfortable one in the end. Well, if you're in a growing process, and if you're in a fixing stuff process, which is what I think this team is in, like I said, I think they would take 35-21, stuff it in their back pocket, Definitely. fly back to Chapel Hill and get the work for Duke. Definitely. And, and get better. So if 35-21, if you make improvements, is fine. Mm. No, the, the nation isn't paying that close attention right now because once they lost to Virginia Tech, they fell off the radar, yeah. even though they're still ranked. And then the way the league has performed, they actually scored 59 points against Virginia and dropped in the coaches' poll. Tells you all you need to know about the ACC. So yeah, they, nobody should worry about any of that stuff right now. Just get better and win. Mm -hmm. Get better and win each week. Get a little bit better and win. Get a little bit better and win. The schedule gives them that opportunity. And when they show up in South Bend, if they're getting incrementally better and they're winning games, they'll be in position to be close to being the team that a lot of people thought that they would see this year. Mm -hmm. So I do think we'll see that this weekend. I have not done my prediction yet on the stat picks. I'm always last to do it because I'm we got 500 other things going. I haven't seen anybody else's picks yet either. So I do have all the emails and I just haven't, I see them pop in about every six hours, but I have not done my pick yet. But I do think Carolina will win. I do think 35-21 is probably in the range, maybe 31-14, 35-14, something like that. 
a game that if it's three touchdowns, maybe it doesn't look like three touchdowns on a snap snap basis. Mm -hmm. But I think Carolina's ability to hit on big plays, the Josh Downs factor, the Mac Mac uh, the Sam Howell factor. I think that that's why they end up winning this game rather comfortably in, in the fourth quarter. Now, it'll be the last eight minutes of the game. I'll be able to write a lot of stuff. I that's that's what I'm about, thinking too. I, I won't be worrying about, oh, well, I kind of wait till after the game because who knows what's going to happen here. Because mm -hmm. I have a long trip back home. My wife works Sunday evening. So and that drive is nurse. Brutal. She's a nurse. She's got to get her sleep and all that stuff. So that's going to, Sunday's going to suck for me. But that drive's brutal. Let's not sugarcoat that either. Yeah, that's I can't it. rush stuff. I need, I need my staff to come through for me Saturday night helping me out. Hey, gotcha. Hint, hint. I will look out for Make you. My life a little easier. Hey, well, I've been on that drive before. It's it's not a fun one. That, that's yeah, I've never enjoyed that drive. Yeah, that's that's a, it's a tough one. It's a long one. It's a long. As Kevin Roy drive. said, it seems like you're in South Carolina for days. I drove to Florida about a month or so ago, about a nine hour drive, and I swear it was better than the six hour one to Atlanta. I promise it was. And it's yeah, crazy well, for I, me to say, but well, I would I'd probably rather do that one again than than the six yeah, hour one to Atlanta. That, would too. <laughs> that one is tough. That one's definitely tough, but. As we said, we'll obviously be down there. AJ will be down there. I think Kevin as well, our video guy, will be down there too. So, yeah, we'll have a couple guys down there in Mercedes-Benz Stadium. AJ's first trip to Mercedes-Benz Stadium, yep. so you best believe he'll be get, rolling get out the, the pictures and check videos. check it off. Oh, yeah, yeah get to check it off. I know you'll be rolling out the pictures and video on social media beforehand too, soaking it all in. It's a cool stadium too if you look at it. It's pretty sweet. I mean, it's – Yeah, yeah, I'll, I'll do all that stuff. It's uh, It'll be fun. When I do that wherever I go anyway, and, yeah. and I like doing it at Bobby Dodd. I kind of wish they were Bobby Dodd because I, I call it the Wrigley Field of college it's football. Great stadium, yeah. Mm -hmm. But um, and you were there a couple of years ago, Bobby. Very Knight. historic. But uh, this is cool, something different, something new. So yeah, yeah I'm good with it. Yeah, absolutely. But, but the thing is, good observation and no typos, right? Yeah, because that's all that matters, man. That's all the that matters. Typos are gonna, you know, the typos are gonna happen. Yeah, oh, of course. It's, it's AJ, man. I'm typos. typos. It's tough, man. Typos are unavoidable, as they say. But uh, I'll be rooting for you. Hopefully, uh, hopefully, Carolina will will wrap it up early in the fourth, so you can get to writing. I actually, every time Carolina blows the team out, I do think about you. I'm like, oh, AJ's up there writing right now. He's He'll be done with his five takeaways. And, and, and you know, the reality, and you know this because you've sat next to me a lot in mm -hmm. a lot of these games, no matter how much I think I have done by the end of the game, after we do the interviews and you and I do our video, I go sit down. It's like an hour after the game. I sit down. I'm like, oh, I really don't have that much done because I end up writing about different stuff. Yeah. You know, we have the two interns, Noah and Brandon, and I tell them, Brandon actually asked me, he goes, how much writing do you do a game? I said, well, I probably write about 2,500, 3,000 words during the course of a game. Hmm. And sometimes I don't use any of it. Race half of it or all of it. Yeah. yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. Plus that's, I have that's the, the life notes of and everything else. Yeah. Exactly. It's just the way it is. That's, that's the life of it, man. You, you don't, you don't really understand it till you get in it, but yeah, sometimes you have a whole story written and you got to erase it. I've, I've been there before too. So we'll, we'll see how it goes in Atlanta. Hopefully you won't have a, hopefully you won't go to bed. Well, hopefully you'll get to get to bed before like 4 a.m. I'm, I'm rooting for you on that. Well, one. it was six. The la <laughs> it was six the last two weeks. Yeah. The 7 30 so. kickoffs are brutal from a journalism yeah. standpoint, but I'm noon, noon games all day long. You know, you realize that we're getting thumbed down right now because nobody wants to hear a journalism. <laughs> hey, man. Nobody wants to hear that. Hey, it's late. Some late nights in there. That's all. That's all I got to say about that. But, you know, you hey, I did walk out of the stadium at like three Saturday morning. It's late, man. You know what I, I mean? Got locked, I got locked in there the week before. I had to get I had to get some worker to help me. That out. doesn't surprise me. Yeah, I, I know you've had a few stories where you've we'll, we'll do a podcast sometimes, all the places I've been locked in. Oh yeah. I would love to talk about that because you I've heard some of the stories, man. You you've got some good ones. Between that and Uber drivers, you've got some fantastic ones to tell. So. Oh, man. Uber drivers. <laughs> I gotta go to South Bend in a month. The Uber drivers in South Bend have always been entertaining. I love it, man. Well, we'll have to get that on a podcast at some point. Yeah. We definitely have to roll that one out, but that'll do it for the uh, Georgia Tech edition of the preview podcast, 7.30 p.m. to kick off, like I mentioned, ACC Network down at Mercedes-Benz Stadium in Atlanta. And for all your coverage leading up to it and after the game, make sure you keep it locked to TarHillIllustrated.com for all your football, basketball, and recruiting stuff as well. Make sure you keep it locked to TarHillIllustrated.com and our YouTube channel, Tar Heel. Illustrate. I've been Jacob Turner. He's been Andrew Jones. Make sure you guys like, share, hit that subscribe button and that notification bell so you know every single time we upload a video. And uh, we'll see you guys in the next one. Thanks. Thanks.